Good evening. My name is Joe Marino, and I'm an assistant professor of Sanskrit and Buddhism in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature. We begin with a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Welcome to the University of Washington Sanskrit Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk is titled, Entwined Like a Word in Its Meaning, Reflections on 50 Years of Sanskrit Studies with Professor Emeritus Richard Solomon. The talk is at once a career retrospective, as told by one of the world's preeminent Sanskritists in a demonstration of the compelling and playful beauty of the Sanskrit language. To all of our colleagues, our students, friends of Sanskrit in the greater Puget Sound region, and those joining from afar, thank you for coming. We're excited to share with you an evening in which we acknowledge the contributions made to our university and community by Professor Richard Solomon, and also the historical importance of the Sanskrit language in the University of Washington's curriculum. I and Dr. Amruta Chandekar, our Sanskrit lecturer, are both former students of Dr. Solomon, and now have the pleasure to continue teaching Sanskrit here at UW. As Professor Solomon will note, we are but the latest in a line of Sanskrit instructors going back over 110 years here. Before tonight's talk, we'd like to share a video which introduces our program and highlights our wonderful students. Many thanks to Russ Hugo, the videographer who helped to tell our story, and of course to our students. The video is about seven minutes long, so we appreciate, appreciate your attention before the event uh, the, the, the main event. It's here that we want to acknowledge the important role of community support in our program. In the wake of several retirements and a lack of sufficient dedicated funding to support the program, we can no longer provide a full course of instruction in Sanskrit with state funding alone. In response to this urgent need, Friends of Sanskrit at UW was formed by members of the community in 2018 to ensure continued instruction in Sanskrit at UW and help connect the local community with our programming at the university. The Friends of Sanskrit at UW Fund has supported the hiring of a Sanskrit lecturer, enabling us to continue to offer all levels of the language, courses on various aspects of Sanskritic culture and literature, and to host public-facing reading and recitation groups. If you'd like to support our program, you can become a friend of Sanskrit by contributing on our website, which you can find most easily by typing in Friends of Sanskrit UW in any browser. If you'd like to join public reading or recitation groups as they are offered, please reach out to me at jamarino at uw.edu. One more note about the process of asking questions tonight. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. After our speaker is finished, we will address as many questions as we can with the time that we have, although we certainly won't get to them all. Now to introduce our speaker, uh, I turn it over to the Department of Asian Languages and Literature's own Professor Emeritus of Hindi, Michael Shapiro. Thank you, Joe, and good evening, friends. I'd like to begin my introduction of my friend and colleague, Rich Solomon, by presenting Sanskrit that are likely to many or all of you. The first of these words is vansha, that can be variously translated as lineage or genealogy. This word shades into another word, parampara, literally tradition or legacy. Tonight's presentation is arguably all about vansha and parampara. It's about the vansha and parampara of Sanskrit instruction here at the University of Washington. One that, as, as we shall hear, goes back over a century and which we would like to extend long into the future. It's also a vansha or parampara of the scholars and teachers, many of them renowned throughout the Sanskrit universe who have been the caretakers of Sanskrit instruction here at the UW. Of the various scholar teachers who have lovingly cultivated the garden of Sanskrit studies here at the UW, none is more illustrious than Rich Solomon. The Department of Asian Languages and Literature was fortunate indeed when it hired Rich first temporarily in 1978 and then permanently in 1982 as an assistant professor of Sanskrit. That Rich evolved into a scholar of international renown is not something I need to elaborate on here. The full version of this story is of Mahabharata-like proportions. But the short version goes something like this. 
Rich earned his BA from Columbia University and his MA and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. His PhD dissertation was on a Sanskrit text dealing with Hindu pilgrimage sites. His interests, however, uh, embraced a broad swatch of mainstream Sanskrit studies. Rich did, however, have some unusual and peculiar side interests, namely paleography and epigraphy, as well as the study of previously undeciphered or little known writing systems of South Asia. And he also had expertise in Prakrit dialects, a field outside the purview of many Indologists. It's worth noting that when in 1996, the British Library sought an established scholar to direct a project to decipher, edit, translate, and interpret a set of birch bark manuscripts from the Gandhara region, representing the earliest surviving manuscripts of the entire Buddhist tradition, it needed someone with expertise in such fields as epigraphy, little known writing systems, as well as ancient Indian languages and dialects, including Prakrit. Rich was the natural choice and the rest, as they say, is history. The development of a new field of inquiry, namely Gandharan studies, to a very great degree occurred as the result of the efforts of the early Buddhist manuscript project, which Rich spearheaded. Let me now say something about Rich's prodigious academic accomplishments. His CV lists seven books and edited volumes and over 200 articles and reviews. I say 200 because that was the number that was there the last time I looked. It's probably considerably greater than that by now. These span virtually every aspect of Sanskrit studies, including Veda and Epic, Kavya, Poetics, Dharmashastra, Chronology, Archaeology, Philosophy, History, and Grammar. He has earned virtually every honor possible for someone in the field, including winning NEH, Guggenheim, and von Humboldt Fellowships, his appointment to the William P. and Ruth Gerberding University Professorship, and recently, his election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been invited to give endowed lectures at major universities of the world in more countries than I can remember. He has become, in effect, an indological superstar. He's come a long way. I should also say something about the rest of the package. Putting it in traditional Indian terms, as a teacher and colleague, Rich is endowed with all of the most desirable qualities or sadgunas. He's a wonderful and caring teacher. He does this by providing substantive and thought out lectures, by constructively and lo lovingly critiquing the work of his students, whether undergraduate or graduate, and tending to the broader intellectual development of these students. As a graduate mentor, he has been all that one could ask for. Students who have had the experience of receiving back from Rich his annotations, comments, suggestions on drafts of their work will know what I mean. When this happens, first comes the shock. Pages of text completely obscured by comments, often in pencil, in Rich's virtually indecipherable handwriting on all aspects of their work. Yet students and colleagues who take the trouble to work through the annotations invariably find their work immeasurably, immeasurably improved by the process. I've been a colleague of Rich for almost 44 years now. For 11 or so of those years, I was the department chair. On countless occasions, I went to Rich with a request, chair this committee, write a report on some long forgotten pressing matter, serve as graduate coordinator, come to my or somebody else's class and give a talk on the Ramayana or the Bhagavad Gita or early Buddhism or Kalidasa or Prakrit inscriptions or on anything else. Rich always agreed to take on whatever it was that needed to be done. This sense of responsibility to the department and its Sanskrit, and its Sanskrit program is a quality that has been essential in building a program in Sanskrit and preserving it in time as a financial retrenchment such as those we have experienced during much of recent history at the UW. The program, in simple terms, the program wouldn't have survived without Rich's leadership of it. In concluding, let me just say that there is no better person to speak to the parampara of Sanskrit studies here at the UW than Rich Solomon. He has established, maintained, and extended an extraordinary legacy of Sanskrit studies here in Seattle.
one that has secured for Seattle a place in the worldwide network of Sanskrit, re of Sanskrit related tirthas. Seattle has really become a tirtha for Sanskrit studies. And he has done so in his characteristically modest and self-effacing manner. And now let me turn the podium over to Rich, whose presentation tonight is entitled, Entwined Like a Word and Its Meaning, Reflections on 50 Years of Sanskrit Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much for that, that uh, fulsome introduction. I want to thank also the people who are here in the room for coming and to everyone else who's uh, listening in on Zoom. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. <coughs> so I'll go now to my PowerPoint presentation. So let me begin with, uh, as you can see on the slide, the opening verse of Kalidasa's poem, The Dynasty of Raghu. Vagartau eva sampraktau vagartha pratipatte jagatha pitarau vande parvati parameshwarau. That's the way I read it. I would like to also play a recording of a traditional pundit who recites in a, a sort of musical fashion that I don't care to uh, attempt in public. Vagartha viva sampraktau vagartha pratipatte jagatha Pitaro Vande Parvati Paramesh. So this is, verse is the opening verse, the uh, what's called the Mangala Shloka, the auspicious opening verse of Kalidasa's epic poem, The Dynasty of Raghu. And in this verse, as you can see uh, from the translation, the poet prays for poetic inspiration to the Hindu god Shiva and his wife, the goddess Parvati, in their combined form this form in which their union is so complete and perfect, entwined like a word and its meaning, that they actually inhabit the same body, with Shiva constituting the right half and Parvati on the left. Kalidasa's inspiration in this verse is to liken the inseparability of this joined god and goddess to the corresponding inseparability of words and their meanings. So this is one, just one example, and I'll mention others later, of Kalidasa's creative genius, which gives him the title of uh, Master of Simile. Kalidasa, Upama Kalidasa Sya is the catchphrase in Sanskrit. Now this uh, figure of the joint god and goddess, male and female uh, joined together, is known in Sanskrit and in Indian languages as Ardhanarishwara, Ardha literally the god who is half woman. And as some of you will, remember, will recognize, it is widely represented in Hindu art, both ancient and modern, elite and popular. This is an example of the classical style of a depiction of Ardhanarishwara from the famous Kajaraho temple. This is dating from past, uh, probably about the 13th century AD or CE. Uh, this is an example of the same motif in a very different style in the modern uh, contemporary folk art of uh, Mithila, the famous Mithila style. And you can see uh, on the left side is the dark bodied Shiva and on the right side is the light-skinned light uh, Parvati. Here is another manifestation, a recent manifestation uh, of the same theme, an actual, an, an actor, a ritual enactor of the role of Ardhanarishwara in a religious festival. So I turn now back to the uh, same verse uh, and uh, want to introduce uh, the poem in which it uh, occurs. So the poem, The Dynasty of Raghu, or in Sanskrit it's called Raghavamsha, uh, is recognized as one of the great classics of Sanskrit literature, if not of world literature. It was composed, let's say, 16th cent uh, about 1600 years ago by Kalidasa, who is uh, generally, if not universally, recognized as the pre-modern India's greatest author. This verse I'll be coming back to again and again uh, in my remarks this evening as a, a sort of light motif. Uh, actually, in preparing and thinking about this presentation, it, it came clear to me that I could speak all night simply on this one verse. Uh, and ignore the other verses, 1,563 of the dynasty of Raghu, uh, 
uh, but I'll try to get a little bit beyond the first verse a little later, at least. The dynasty of Raghu is one of the classic examples of one of the main genres of Sanskrit literature, namely Mahakavya, which means just literally just the great poem, and which corresponds, very roughly speaking, to ornate epic poet, poetry and other traditions. Roughly, uh, one could compare the uh, Virgil's Aeneid in the European literary tradition. On the screen, uh, you see just a brief uh, summary of the uh, contents uh, and, uh, um, and other information on the Raghuvamsa or dynasty of Raghu, uh, mythic or heroic or legendary history of the kings of the Ikshwaku dynasty uh, from the time of Dilipa to Nivarna, 29 kings, focusing, not surprisingly, on the, t uh, the reign of Rama, the fifth king in the line. Uh, the author, I already told you, the date, like many dates in, uh, in Sanskrit literary history, is uncertain and controversial. Uh, the period of between the 4th and 5th century, that is the time of the Gupta dynasty, sometimes called India's Golden Age, is the l most likely uh, time for Kalidasa. The poem as a whole consists is divided into cant what are what is usually translated as cantos sanskrit sarga uh, a sarga uh, there are 19 sargas uh, they average between about 50 and 100 verses or shloka uh, and the total number of verses as i already mentioned is 1564 uh, the poem may or may not be complete depending on how you interpret it that's a point of controversy in literary history, but I won't go into that uh, today. And then uh, the structure of the poem is essentially divided. The 19 cantos are divided into three um, subsections. First, Rama's ancestors, then cantos 10 through 15, which can be considered the core of the present uh, of the um, work is the story of Rama, uh, which is uh, something like a reworking of the Ramayana in a highly creative, poetic fashion. And then the third part, uh, the cantos 16 through 19, are Rama's successors, 24 of them, uh, ending with the reign of the dissolute King Agnivarna. Rightly or wrongly, uh, the, this poem, The Dynasty of Raghu, is not normally mentioned among the classics of ancient, the ancient, uh, the literature of the ancient world. Um, and I think that uh, one of the reasons for that, at least, is that it borders uh, on the on untranslatable. Enorm it's an enormous challenge to a translator. And the reason that it is nearly intranslatable, in my opinion, is that in it, the words and their meanings are so entwined, as the poet tells us himself, that to pull them apart by putting the words into another me into another language inevitably doesn't loses its link with the meaning. So you, you can't translate it without losing some of the meaning. Let me return to my um, light motif, the first verse, uh, and um, say a few more comments about about it. Um, first, uh, I wanted to I wanted to briefly pay, play an excerpt from a traditional commentary on, on the poem, which goes through each word of each, verses, of each verse uh, and explains the meaning, literal and uh, uh, figurative meanings. Uh, so I'm just gonna p play uh, a few minutes of the recitation by the same pundit that I played before, a uh, recitation of the traditional commentary. And you might be able to catch, and I'll try to uh, point it out with my pointer, um, which words uh, he is talking about and explaining. Vagiti Vagartha viva ityekam padam Ivena saha nitya samaso vivakya lo pascha Purva pada prakruti swaratvam cheti vakta vyam Evam anyatra pidrasta vyam Vagartha viva Shaddartha viva Sampruktu nitya sambadha vityartha. So uh, back to the first verse. What does it really mean to say? that the supreme God, goddess and God are entwined like a word and its meaning. This famous line, line is, among other things, an allusion to the self-conception of the Sanskrit language, or at least to the speakers thereof. 
By this, I mean that the notion that the words of the Sanskrit language are fundamentally, intrinsically, and inseparably linked to the things and concepts that they express. The words and their corresponding meanings are as inextricably linked as the female and fe male and female creative powers, the goddess and the god who engendered the universe that, Sanskrit, that the Sanskrit language verbalizes. Sanskrit, in other words, in this traditional point of view, is the on, one and only real and true language that expresses in its every word the reality of the universe. All other universes, all other languages are inherently inferior to it, either as degenerate derivatives or apabramsas, that is, the modern, uh, the other Indian languages, or merely as barbarian babble. But there's another way, uh, in fact, several other ways, in which Parvati and Parameshwara are entwined like a word and its meaning. One aspect that I want to address here is expressed through and in terms of one of the special features of Sanskrit grammar and syntax. In the, word, in the verse in question, we note, you may note a series of words which end with the, which have the ending au, au in transliterated form and marked in red, or in one case with the AAV, which is uh, simply a positional variant of the same ending. And this au ending marks the dual form of Sanskrit words. Uh, in most of the languages that most of you are familiar with, I imagine there are on, you have only the category of singular and plural. Uh, you uh, indicate the plur uh, plurality more than one thing by adding, in most cases, s to the noun in question. Uh, in Sanskrit and in several other, quite a few other languages of the world, uh, there is a third category, which is the form of the word, which is used to in indicate two things or a pair of uh, things, the so-called dual ending. So obviously, we're talking about two entities here, uh, Parvati and Shiva, uh, so we have the dual ending. Notice, however, particularly that the words Parvati and Parameshwara, the name of the goddess, the goddess and the god, are joined together in what's called a dvandva compound in Sanskrit, a, a nominal compound whereby you take two nouns and put them together and they essentially form, constitute, grammatically constitute one word. And there's no uh, additional marking of that. There's no and, as we would say in English. So, in this way, the unity of Parvati and Parameshwara is grammatically coded by putting them together into a single word, Parvati Parameshwara, and marking it as, a two, mar as two entities. Um, in English, we have to add, if you translate this into English, you have to add and, which is implied in the Sanskrit. Um, but then, as I said before, you are losing something of the original Sanskrit, the very structure that those two words are grammatically fused, indicating the, in, uh, the uh, juncture, the um, unity of those uh, two names. Uh, this is uh, an, a, simple, a small and simple example of what I refer to as the untranslatability of the poem. The, part that grammatically uh, emphasizes their ins inseparable unity cannot be directly rendered into uh, English or any other modern language that I'm aware of. I'm going to turn uh, my subject now to um, a section that I call the incarnations of the dynasty of Raghu. Well, I've just been bashing translations of the Raghuvamsa, uh, but I, I should uh, give you at least a few examples. Uh, I salute the scholars who, uh, who are brave enough to attempt a, tr a translation of this poem. I wouldn't do it. I prefer to stay with the original. Uh, but here, for a, one example, is uh, a translation by Robert Antoine, published in Calcutta in 1972. Uh, which I recommend uh, among the English translations. Uh, this attempt to translate Raghuvamsha or Dynasty of Raghu uh, has been made in many languages. Here's, for one example, uh, a French translation published in 1928 by the uh, very famous uh, Sanskrit scholar Louis Renou. In 
times gone by in the European world, uh, things would even be translated into Latin. So here is a Latin translation of the Dynasty of Raghu, published by Stenzler in uh, 1832. As I've probably made clear, I'm just not a great fan of translations in general. Um, they are, uh, in some sense, a shadow of the real work. So let me show a little bit of the real thing uh, or something closer to what I would consider the real thing. And these are published, printed, modern Sanskrit editions of the poem of the Raghavamsa. And there are many, and I'll show another uh, shortly. Uh, this is a, a fairly recent, relatively recent one, an important publication in 1973, excuse me, by uh, Rewa Prasad Dwivedi, Faruguvamsa uh, with a commentary of Hemadri. But even these printed text editions in Sanskrit with Sanskrit commentaries are not really the real thing yet. The real thing uh, is in the manuscripts, in the traditional uh, handwritten manuscripts which for centuries, millennia, uh, Sanskrit, traditional Sanskrit scholars, pundits, did their work. Uh, so here's a, a, a traditional manuscript, not very old. It's not, probably not more than two or three centuries old, um, but a very nice manuscript. And I've marked in red. Uh, some of you will recognize our now familiar first verse, Vagartha Vivasam Prakta Vagartha Pratipattaye, the first verse of the our poem, Dynasty of Raghu. I also like this manuscript, which looks very different from the previous one. I'll flip back for a minute. Very nice and neat, all clean and uh, well preserved. This one looks like a, an awful mess, full of uh, notations and corrections and per notes of various kinds. Uh, but I actually, I prefer this manuscript. Here you really see the Sanskrit tradition, the pundit tradition uh, at work. And you can imagine this pundit who maybe a century or two ago studied it carefully and wrote these comments and annotations and uh, corrections. So this is much closer to the real Raghuvamsa. In fact, it's as close as we can ever get. Uh, the real um, Raghavamsa would theoretically be the actual text that um, Kalidasa wrote out on palm leaves 15 or 1600 years ago, but of course that is uh, long gone. I'd like to take a, a side trip now uh, here at the University of Washington. So I criticized a little bit printed editions as being not quite the real thing. They're just derivatives really of the traditional manuscripts we have them here. Uh, but I do, there is one uh, printed edition that I have a sentimental connection with. This is my first copy of the dynasty of Raghu, the Raghuvamsa, which I bought in India in, I'm not sure exactly, maybe 1973 or 1974. And as you can see, I, I have loved it well. Um, I carried it with me uh, in a period when I was exploring India and taking long train rides and uh, carrying my Raghuvamsa with me and reading it, which led to, as you might imagine, some interesting conversations. Um, people, uh, especially in those days when foreigners are, were not very commonly seen in India, uh, and uh, a lot of people noticed a strange young foreigner sitting reading a Sanskrit book as uh, the train trundled along. Uh, and that uh, opened up all sorts of questions, uh, sometimes interesting, sometimes uh, not so welcome. Uh, but uh, basically they involve, uh, involved people asking me to explain myself. Uh, uh, why, why are you doing this? And I did the, my best uh, and had some interesting discussions. One gentleman uh, suggested that I must have been a Brahmin in my previous life, uh, and uh, I could neither confirm nor deny that. I suppose it's possible. Uh, <clears throat> these sorts of conversations uh, happen here, too, uh, when I meet someone and I have to explain who I am and what I do. And I say, well, I teach Sanskrit. Uh, that doesn't always get a great reaction. Occasionally it does, uh, but it raises questions like, what the heck is that? And the other question is, why do you do that? Uh, and sometimes uh, people say, or I can see them thinking, why in the world would anybody spend his entire life studying Sanskrit? Uh, 
And then in my mind I'd say, why would anybody ever want to spend their life doing anything else? But I don't usually say that. Uh, sometimes I do, if I think I can get away with it. But the question is always, uh, why? And uh, the answer is a long story. I'll give the very abridged and partly part of the truth uh, version of it, which is that in 1968, I was a young and un somewhat unfocused and directionless college student. Uh, and more or less on a whim, I signed up for a course that sounded interesting. It's called First Year Sanskrit. And I sat in and within as I recall it, within the first or maybe it was the second week of class, I was hooked. And I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do with my life, and I was lucky enough to actually do that. Uh, again, I'll, I'll spare you all the many details, but um, after a lot of hard work and also some good luck, in 1981 I was appointed as assistant professor uh, of Sanskrit at the University of Washington, and uh, I never left. I won't go into the details of my career here, uh, but I did want to go back and talk a little bit about the prehistory, as it were, <coughs> excuse me, the prehistory of Sanskrit teaching at the University of Washington. And for that, we have to uh, mention the Reverend Herbert Gowan. Um, and of course, our Gowan Hall, where a Department of Asian Languages and Literature is housed and where I and many of my colleagues have spent many, many happy hours. Uh, Gowan Hall is named after uh, the Reverend uh, Herbert Gowan, who was uh, quite a celebrity in his time. Uh, and among his distinctions, the one that I particularly uh, admire, is that in the year 1910, and here we're looking at the course catalog for UW in 19, the academic year 1910 and 11, he introduced for the first time a special course in elementary uh, Sanskrit grammar. Reverend Gowan was quite a polymath of a type that it would be completely impossible to be nowadays. Uh, he, as you can see in this slide uh, from the same course catalog, he taught uh, the classical literature of Japan, Japan uh, Buddhist philosophy, literature of India, Semitic archaeology, Sanskrit, of course, again, and even uh, a special course in Biblical Hebrew. Uh, he was also the author of many books, including uh, a very uh, commendable, if somewhat outdated na by now, book on the history of Indian literature almost 100 years ago. So uh, at the bottom uh, of, of it all, we are grateful to Reverend Gowan, that Sanskrit has been taught at the University of Washington for over 110 years, although for uh, truth and disclosure, uh, that has not been a, a discontinuous program. Uh, but uh, overall, this has been going for more than 110 years. And I am proud to have followed in the footsteps of Reverend Gowan and several other eminent predecessors in this lineage, this parampara, as Mike Shapiro mentioned, uh, and as my deep hope that this tradition will continue long into the future. I'm not finished. I actually want to go back to the dynasty of Raghu and mention a few more points of uh, interest and special features of this poem. Uh, <clears throat> I want to give you uh, a little more of a taste of the richness, the complexity, the subtlety, and the sheer beauty of Sanskrit literature that captivated me at a tender age and never let me go. So far, I've only talked about the first verse of the poem, uh, so at least I can give you a little sample of the rest of the 1,563 other verses. Uh, so I'll show you and play the, uh, at least the second and third verses, wherein the poet explains and apologizes for his humble efforts to um, to describe the vast dynasty of Raghu. And I'll play the recording of, mm, sorry. First two, uh, translation 
I won't read, you can see it. And uh, the third verse, carrying on into the apology, I'll read this one myself. Manda kaviyasha prarti kamishyam yupahasyatam pramsulabhye pale lobad udbahu rivamanaha. A fool striving for a poet's glory, they will only laugh at me. I'm like a greedy dwarf stretching for a fruit that only a giant could reach. Uh, I think these two verses uh, speak for themselves uh, and give you an, a little more idea of the very vivid imagery uh, and clever similes that Kalidasa was famous for and which give him his title of Master of the Simile. And now I go back one more time, the last time, to the first verse. There is still more to be said. The translation that I cited before and that I reproduce here uh, is the traditional, represents a traditional interpretation, that it means I salute Parvati and Parameshwara. But this is not the only possible interpretation. And some connoisseurs of the tradition, at least, uh, argue, in fact, that there's a second kind of concealed meaning, and that I've tried to show in this slide here. The, here um, I've reproduced the last part of the verse, the last quarter of the verse, uh, as it is, and it's almost the same, but please note that I've moved the hyphen and I remind you, the hyphen is just an artifact of, of my editing of the text. There, there would be no hyphen between Parvati and Parameshwara in the original uh, text as it was, would be written. Um, but what happened is that someone along the line noticed that you could read, instead of Parvati, Parameshwara, you could divide that compound, that dvandva joint noun compound, into Parvati, Parameshwara instead of Parvati Parameshwara. What does that mean, Parvati Parameshwara? Well, Parvati Pa means the protector of Parvati. And who is protector of Parvati? Shiva. And Rameshwara is the husband or lord of Rama. And Rama is Lakshmi, goddess of good luck and fortune, and her protector is the god Vishnu. So just by seeing, looking at that compound word Parvati Parameshwara and reading it, not changing it in any way, but reading it in a different way, uh, the poem ends up, uh, the verse has an entirely different meaning. Instead of a prayer to Shiva and Parvati, it's a prayer to the gods, sh the gods Shiva and Vishnu, uh, called the, then called being the parents of the world. Well, that's a, certainly a less familiar concept, but I did manage to find one uh, rather quaint representation of the joint of Vishnu and Shiva as a joint deity. Uh, Shiva, again, we can see uh, with his dark skin is here at the right side of the body and light-skinned Vishnu on the left. So, Simply by reinterpreting the verse, not changing it all in any way, but reinterpreting it in a grammatically valid way, uh, we have end up with an entire, what's, what seems to be an entirely different cosmological view, uh, gram legitimately derived, grammatically correct from the identical text. But I, hesitate, I uh, hasten to stress that these two views, these two interpretations, though entirely different, they're not necessarily irreconcilable. For in the characteristically flexible and inclusive theology of Hinduism, both of these conceptions actually can be accepted simultaneously without any sense of conflict or uh, contradiction. So here I've given, I've depicted visually the two interpretations as it were, the two possible interpretations of this single verse. From the Indian point of view, I would say, in my interpretation, in my understanding, with this alternative interpretation, we're dealing not with a contradiction, but rather a supplementation of meaning. Two truths which, though not logical compati logically compatible, are accepted and expressed simultaneously. This ambiguity of this verse whether it or not it was actually intended by Kalidasa, and again, the traditional scholars argue about this. Uh, some 
say that it's over-interpreted, reading in too much. Others say that it's a deeper interpretation, matter of judgment. But in any case, this double meaning embodies, to my mind, the very essence of the Hindu attitude towards theology and cosmology. For those of us who come from uh, the th background of the monotheistic cultures of the Western world, it may seem puzzling or to some even disturbing that a single verse can be believed to simultaneously express two radically different understandings of the supreme powers of the universe. But this is troubling, if it is troubling to anyone, only from the point of view and on the basis of the presuppositions of the exclusivist monotheistic cultures in which, as we are constantly reminded, there is one and only one God. The Hindu worldview is, on the contrary, emphatically inclusivist. That is to say, it is comfortable with simultaneous and seemingly or superficially incompatible presentations of the truth. In short, as the Vedic sages say, there is one truth which the wise call by many names, ekam sat vipra bahudavadanti. This is a very proverbial quotation which everyone knows from the Rig Veda, the most ancient uh, Indian scripture. And uh, considered by many to be really, uh, to encapsulate the essence of the Hindu worldview. So I now conclude first uh, with an apology for not getting past the third verse out of the 1564 of the uh, entire poem, uh, but the, it's getting late. Uh, I hope, uh, I, f I feel and I hope correctly that there is something to be gained by taking a close look at a very small part of a very big poem. I could literally have uh, d discussed the first verse alone long into the night. So many are its subtleties and levels of meanings, but I'll, uh, I'll spare you. I do hope that I've succeeded in giving you some taste of the subtlety, complexity, and profundity of Sanskrit literature and the culture which it represents. And also along the way, perhaps I've given you some sense of why why and how I and so many other people over the centuries in India and in the world have gotten incurably addicted to it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Solomon, for that wonderful lecture. I want to make sure, given our technical difficulties, everyone can hear me from where I am now. So please don't hesitate to let us know if there is any audio issue. Uh, I think this is an opportunity for us to uh, give Professor Solomon a big round of applause. If you already have, let's do it once more. We do have some folks in the room that I think can contribute to some of the uh, uh, congratulations. So once more, thank you very much, Professor Solomon. At this point, we begin the Q&A section of the event. Um, as a reminder, you can simply type your questions into the Q&A section, and we will get to as many as we can with the time that we have. Um, so let's just begin. Uh, Rich, I will answer the questions from here and transfer them over to you and uh, mute myself as you begin to answer. That makes sense? So one of our questions has to do with this manuscript, Rich, that you had called messy, one of the messier manuscripts. And it was messy maybe because it had some comments on it or in, in the, uh, the margins. How does this kind of messy manuscript represent the South Asian manuscript tradition? Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about what sorts of comments one might find uh, in a manuscript like that? The, yeah, that, that's a great question. Raises a lot of issues. Um, uh, when I described the manuscript as messy, I didn't mean that it represents a messy tradition, but it represents a very uh, um, detailed analytic uh, tradition. Uh, and I think don't remember the details of what those annotations were, but typically you might find something that's similar to, I, I played uh, earlier on a, a little snippet of the um, commentary, the ver word by word commentary on the word. So that's, and it takes each word, explains it grammatically and uh, interpretively or poetically. Uh, so much of the annotation you'll see in uh, like that uh, image that I showed would be excerpts from such a commentary or just maybe some reader's personal comments. In, in some cases, there are corrections. 
uh, additions or corrections, which shows that uh, someone was studying them, reading them carefully. Uh, so these, uh, these messy manuscripts can be really interesting and uh, can help you a lot in understanding of the, the text and the interpretive tradition. This I think you know so well from your work on Gandhari manuscripts as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question which I'll just mention to plant the seed for you. Uh, does Professor Solomon have a blog? How can we tap into the joys of his explorations? Food for thought, a blog later maybe. Maybe not. Okay, we'll talk about it. No worries. Um, okay, a, a serious question it has to do with interpretation of the image of Vishnu and Shiva. Yeah. So one, this is an iconographic question. In the image given for interpretation B with Vishnu and Shiva, can you say something about what they're holding in their hands? Are you familiar with the art historical tradition? Okay. Am I on now? Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Um, the first question, I, I don't have a blog. I'm not a modern person, uh, and I'm having trouble keeping up with the modern way of doing things, but uh, maybe I can catch up with on that. Um, the, uh, the image of Vishnu and Shiva, uh, I have to admit, uh, that's something kind of marginal. That's actually from a, I believe from an 18th century travelogue by I think a Frenchman traveling in, in India uh, and in Asia. Uh, so I don't know where he saw that. It's a very unusual image uh, and I, I just pulled it up because it nicely illustrates the, uh, the point that I was making about the secondary interpretation. And the, the things that he holds in his hand, uh, I, I guess I can't go back to that. Uh, let me just see if I can quickly go back to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, they're not at all the standard uh, items that, uh, you know, Vishnu and Shiva, they have certain uh, um, uh, standard, uh, what is it called, uh, features. So there should, if, the, if that's, um, uh, Sh uh, Vishnu on the on the right side of the body, the proper right. He looks like he's holding a deer. He should be holding a, a, a chakra, a wheel. So this is uh, actually a, a strange and untypical image, um, and I can't really explain it. It's probably not an accurate representation, uh, but it does strike me that this uh, French traveler must have seen something like a joint uh, image of Vishnu and Shiva, but they're, it's not at all a common thing. So you, you're right to ask. Okay, the next question says, thank you, Rich, for walking us through Kalidasa's Raghavansha and various approaches to appreciating it. I'm curious, of your thoughts on Kalidasa's depiction of the final king, Agnivarna, oh. and the ultimate message of this messy ending. Oh. Um, yeah, that's another really interesting question, and that's one of the several things that I would have talked about if I had, uh, if I felt that I could keep you here all night. Uh, so I, I actually thought of uh, discussing the first verse and the last verse. Uh, but I, I didn't go that way. Um, Agni Varna is uh, the, I think, 19th successor of the great Rama. Uh, and he, this is a very peculiar uh, description. Um, he was what we would call nowadays a sex addict. And he was completely obsessed with his, his wives and his harem uh, and his uh, lovers. and. Uh, as, I mean, that's not a unique uh, pattern in world history. Monarchs, uh, kings sometimes go that way because they can. Um, but of course, uh, it can, leads to all sorts of problems and he neglected his duties and the kingdom began to be uh, weakened and um, endangered. And in the last verse that the questioner refers to, um, his, one of his wives becomes pregnant, he finds out that she's pregnant. And that's the end of the, the, uh, the poem. It just seems to end in the middle of it. So that's why, and I mentioned this briefly, uh, some people believe that it was an unfinished poem. Uh, it certainly seems that way, but there's no way, uh, way to prove it. So either it was unfinished for whatever reason, Kalidasa perhaps died, who knows, 
Um, or perhaps he was just sending a message that um, the, this king, and I can imagine, and now I'm just really historically fantasizing because we have no real historical context for these kinds of poems, but I can imagine that this was a point in history where he felt, he, Kalidasa, felt that the system was going downhill, perhaps there was a dissolute king, um, and uh, that the mention of the, the pregnancy in the last verse was maybe a, a glimmer of hope that the dynasty would then pass on back into responsible hands. Uh, that's my guess, and it's no more than that. It's, it's a great mystery, so good question. All right, thank you, good answer. Um, this next question, um, now, Rich, I know you've also studied other ancient languages and ha have a hobby of, of doing this to a certain extent as well. So could you talk some more about why you find Sanskrit studies so fascinating in comparison to other ancient languages? Uh, also, for somebody who doesn't know much about Sanskrit, could you briefly talk about what modern languages have Sanskrit as one of the roots? Big question, but... Yeah, big question, good question. Um, so I'll do the second half first because it's easier. Um, modern languages, um, basically, all, all Indian languages have Sanskrit presence, but of a different kind. The, the North Indian languages, which we call, for lack of a better term, Indo-Aryan languages, that is Hindi, Punjabi, Gujarati, Uriya, Bangla, Assamese, etc., are more or less directly derived from Sanskrit in the same way that French and Spanish uh, and Italian are directly derived from uh, Latin. But even other Indian languages, that is to say, mostly the Dravidian languages, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, etc., are not genetically derived from Sanskrit, but they are much influenced by Sanskrit. So, for instance, uh, um, Kannada has many Sanskrit loan words. So that's actually comparable to the relationship of English to Latin. Uh, English is not genetically derived from Latin, uh, but it has much influence through French, etc., and many Latin loan words. So that was the second half of the question. Now I'm Trying to remember the first half. Uh, Has that to do with your interest in Sanskrit, Sanskrit in, in comparison with other ancient Oh, languages. okay, right, yeah. Well, actually, you know, I, I mentioned that I started studying Sanskrit as an undergraduate in 1968, and before that I was uh, planning to major in Latin. And Latin, in a way, didn't quite do it for me, and I can't say exactly why, but then I took Sanskrit, and, and they, Latin and Sanskrit are related languages, and they're structurally very similar. Uh, but something Sanskrit just jumped out at me in the way. I, I felt that uh, part of it was that Latin is, is very much trodden field. There's not, not much, well, I, I don't know if there are any classicists in the room. Uh, I hope not. Uh, there's not really all that much left to do in comparison to Sanskrit and Indian ancient Indian languages, which are wide open, uh, and there are very exciting new developments in, in so many subfields going on uh, today. So uh, that's part of it. I think also, for reasons that I couldn't explain, the, the, struct, the language itself, the sound of it, the extremely complex structure, which turns off some people, especially Indian high school students, who proverbially dread Sanskrit class, um, but uh, to me, it, uh, it was uh, fascinating. And, and that was mentioned, I, I noticed some of the students in the video that you showed before this, uh, some of the students, uh, Vince and others, uh, expressed their fascination. And then the entire, the new India cultural world of India, which I previously knew nothing about, it, uh, excuse the expression, blew my mind, and I've never gotten beyond it. So I hope that's some kind of answer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to rephrase this next question slightly. Um, can you say something about Sanskrit manuscripts in India that have not yet been studied? Um, are there few? Are there many? Uh, what state 
are, are many of these Sanskrit manuscripts in if we were to find them in special collections or uh, where, where might one find these and, and what kind of work needs to be done on them? Big question, good question. Uh, I want to mention uh, there was a, a scholar, actually an expert in the history of science at Brown University for many years named David Pingree who was a, a great expert in, among other things, Indian, uh, the history of Indian astronomy and astrology. And he did an enormous amount of work traveling around India, collect, finding, collecting these manuscripts. And he once estimated that there are approximately 30 million Sanskrit manuscripts in India, or, or at least were in his time. And uh, a great many of them are where they belong, in libraries and other uh, collections. A lot of them are or used to be in private hands, uh, and there you can hear sort of horror stories about, uh, you know, in a typical Indian, modern Indian family, you know, grandpa was a Sanskrit pundit, and the kids are working in a call center or, or uh, uh, IT, going to ITT or whatever, uh, uh, um, uh, IIT, uh, and uh, when grandpa dies, they just threw out all that old stuff in the attic, which were priceless collection of Sanskrit manuscripts. Um, you hear these stories, and I, I'm afraid they are partly true. There are people, scholars in India and elsewhere, who are, I mentioned David Pingree in particular, uh, who are working to save and record uh, these manuscripts. And especially now, uh, when things can be scanned and put on the internet, uh, that's a huge, I mean, there's there's a great deal to be done, um, but that's a, a huge step in the right direction. Um, the uh, one, a subfield uh, of, Indi uh, Bud of Indian manuscripts are Buddhist manuscripts, which happens to be uh, what I have turned to. Early in my career, I worked on uh, traditional Sanskrit, Hindu Sanskrit manuscripts like the ones that I showed, uh, but then I had a I sort of shifted gears in mid-career and uh, have been working mostly on Buddhist manuscripts and that's a hugely exciting field um, uh, during the last couple of decades, uh, as Joe, you know well, um, uh, extremely early manuscripts, by far the oldest Indian manuscripts uh, ever found have been discovered going back to even apparently into the BC period. Uh, so, so the, the short answer is yes, we're working on it. Uh, there are a lot of people who are working to save and preserve and, and uh, make these manuscripts accessible. I'm going to ask another big question from the audience, uh, but I think a, a, an excellent one. Can you say something about access to the study of Sanskrit manuscripts, particularly by women and members of uh, lower castes? Um, yeah, uh, this has become an issue in uh, recent years. Um, I don't really feel very qualified to answer that. I haven't been involved in those, uh, those issues. Uh, but there, I know there is a, a movement or, well, a, a group of people, uh, mostly women, who are arguing against San Sanskrit as a male preserve. And uh, certainly there's something to that uh, charge, uh, although there are famous exceptions through history. There are uh, some female authors of Sanskrit texts, but, uh, well, frankly, pretty marginally. Uh, so there is a mo movement going on. Um, the name that comes to my mind is Ananya Vajpayee, who I think is in Delhi, who is a, a vocal spokesman, for, excuse me, spokesperson for uh, involving women in Sanskrit studies, but I, I couldn't say much more of the details on that. Okay, perhaps a question that ties into your interest in, in Hebrew as well. Uh, one question says, in Hebrew, there are multiple readings of scripture, such as a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, or a voice crying out in the wilderness, sorry, a voice crying out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, or a voice crying out in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. But the claim is either one or the other is correct, depending on your uh, faith profession. So this, this person says exclusive readings rather than multiple 
Hebrew uses the dual quite significantly. So does Greek as well. Is this typical of many ancient languages, particularly the use of the dual? And uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll just talk about ambiguity in, in reading ancient languages, how, how a scholar deals with ambiguity. And then also, is there something to say about the dual? Um, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's a loaded question. I'll try to answer it briefly because I know time is flying. Um, yeah, I think I said Sanskrit has the dual category and other languages do as well. Um, and that's true. And uh, uh, I think you, the questioner mentioned um, uh, Greek, which has a, uh, ancient Greek, which has a dual category, and Hebrew, which has a dual category. Um, Latin does not. Um, but there is a difference, which is that in, uh, in most languages that have a dual category, grammatical category, let me just clarify this. Uh, I mean, I'll just give an example. It said the word for horse is ashwa. So one horse is ashwa, two horses are ashwa, ending that I should, three horses ashwaha. So you just change the ending and it means one, two, or more than three. There are languages that have trial, special grammatical category for three, and I think maybe even for four in one or two cases. But the dual, I mean, world language is not terribly rare. But Sanskrit is unusual in one way. Um, in most languages, the dual is restricted to natural pairs. Um, so you, if you were talking about um, uh, a pair of uh, your eyes, you'd put them in the dual. Uh -huh. But if you're talking about two little boys walking on the street, you'd put it in the plural. So it's, um, it's restricted to actual pairs in Greek and in Sanskrit, uh, I'm sorry, in Greek and in Hebrew, that's the case as well. But in Sanskrit, it, rather than being sort of vitiated and weakened and specialized, it's actually expanded um, and it's used mandatorily for, uh, for all pairs. So. Um, Th that uh, says something about the special character of Sanskrit, uh, which is uh, that whereas in most languages there's a tendency towards grinding down the grammar and simplifying and eliminating superfluous morphology and forms, Sanskrit, it's the more the better. Uh, and they, I, in effect, you can look at and say the Sanskrit actually took the, the original, you could make an argument that historically, if you go back to Indo-European roots, that uh, originally Sanskrit had this uh, limited dual number and actually expanded it to all unlimited, all, all pairs. So I hope I've answered that interesting question. <clears throat> um, this one's fairly straightforward. Can you maybe say something about Raghuvansha commentaries? And is there one particular one that uh, you'd recommend or that has a big influence on the transmission of the text over time? Um, yeah, the commentary that pretty much everybody reads ex ex except for real specialists is a commentary of Malinata. And Malinata who lived in the, I think, 14th century in South India, he was the great commentary, co great commentator. Uh, and his commentaries are beautiful. They're fascinating, they're clear, they're complex, they're subtle, uh, but there are, at least four other well-known commentaries, and there are probably many others. There are probably ones you know, in manuscripts in somebody's attic that nobody has studied yet. Um, when I showed, uh, a little while ago, I showed uh, the, one of the modern text editions uh, by uh, Dvivedi's edition, and that had the commentary of Hemadri, which is another uh, authoritative commentary. Um, and as I said, there are many others, some not yet in printed, in published forms. Malinata is the man for commentary. Um, this question, I think, well, I'll read the question. Throughout all these years, what keeps bringing you back to Kalidasa? Uh, now that you're retired, what material do you find yourself drawn to and why? Uh, yeah, that's a, um, I think uh, I, I came back to Kalidasa actually partly because of this lecture, because uh, I, you know, this has been in the 
pl planning stage for I don't know a long time. Uh, and I, I felt I didn't want to talk about my current specialized research on Buddhist manuscripts and Gandharan culture and so forth. And I wanted to do something more mainstream. And I said to myself, this is maybe a year and a half or more ago, uh, what's mainstream? And I say, I haven't read Rakhavamsha in a long time. And pulled it off the shelf, that old ratty old uh, copy, and started going, and, and I, I went back to it. So, you know, I've, I've kind of gone away from classical Sanskrit literature in my research career in the last 20 or 25 years, but I haven't forgotten it, and I like to uh, keep it warm. Uh, so, uh, and I, I certainly will continue reading this stuff as long as as long as I can. Okay, as we're winding down, I will, um, in fact, I think that you can't beat that question <laughs> as a, a final question for Rich. Maybe I'll just uh, um, uh, ask uh, which, Maybe I'd ask you to tell the audience what one or two of your current projects are as you're uh, moving, you know, into retirement, but still very much working. Well, uh, my current projects are, as I said, mostly in the uh, Buddhist area and uh, working on studying and publishing and translating these uh, manuscripts that I mentioned, uh, going going back to the late BC, early AD period. Uh, so my main agenda, my bucket list item number one uh, is um, a manuscript which was actually purchased by the Library of Congress some years ago. Um, and it's a, a fascinating manuscript. Um, it, it's called the Bahubuddha Sutra, the, the Sutra of Many Buddhas. And it talks about the lineage of the Buddha um, you know, Buddhists believe there isn't just one Buddha, there are Buddhas successively through, through the ages. Uh, and it describes the, these, the 15 current latest Buddhas and their ca characteristics and differences. Uh, and this is on a, um, a very fragmentary birth scroll of Birch Park, which was written uh, some about uh, 19 centuries ago, probably in, um, uh, probably in Afghanistan. Um, and I've been working on this on, and like most academics, you know, I've been flirting with that as a research project for, I don't even want to say the number of years, because it's kind of, I'm kind of ashamed of it and frustrated by it. But every academic has this big project that's always, it's always on the back burner. Uh, so now it's on the front burner and uh, publishing that will be my my number one. And uh, if I get to that in time, uh, there, there's a lot more of that where it came from. Uh, but much of it I'll pass on to my students, including you. Glad to hear it. Uh, OK, so thank you very much, Professor Solomon. Once again, if everyone can offer a round of applause. Yeah. Lucky to have you to come give this talk. Um, both, both uh, online and live. And uh, by way of closing, just a couple brief comments. I'm gonna share a slide. So it's here that we want to acknowledge the important role of community support in our program. And I think this is what you were unable to hear from me at the beginning of our talk today. In the wake of several retirements and a lack of sufficient dedicated funding to support this program, we can no longer provide a full course of instruction in Sanskrit with just state funding. In response to this urgent need, the Friends of Sanskrit at UW was formed by members of the local community in 2018 to ensure continued instruction in Sanskrit at UW and to help connect the local community with UW Sanskrit programming. The Friends of Sanskrit Fund has supported the hiring of a Sanskrit lecturer, enabling the department to continue to offer all levels of the language courses on various aspects of Sanskritic culture and literature, and to host public facing reading and recitation groups. If you would like to support our program, you can become a friend of Sanskrit by donating on our website. You can also learn more about our current and upcoming courses.
The easiest way to find it is to search for Friends of Sanskrit UW in any web browser. Or if you have your phone handy, you can use the QR code on the screen simply by pointing your phone camera at it. If you'd like to join public reading or recitation groups as they are offered, probably next mid-summer at some point, please reach out to me at jamarino at uw.edu. Okay, once again, thank you, uh, everybody, our, our students, our colleagues, our guests from afar, our friends of Sanskrit, and once again, Rich Solomon. We look forward to many more uh, events like this in the future, hopefully fully live, fully in person. Uh, so please, please do come back uh, to us when we do this again. Take care. <laughs>